After three years of enduring some of the world's most stringent COVID containment measures, on December 7th, 2022, China abandoned its zero COVID policy. Overnight, mass testing, lockdowns and travel restrictions were relaxed. The speed in which it was done took the world by surprise. Now, the question is, is that wrong? I think it's uh, the right course and, and then high time to open that. It's highly expected by both people in China and outside China. But in less than two months of opening, infection and deaths skyrocketed. I don't think it's implausible that there's been a very large number of COVID deaths. As citizens grapple with the disease. Was China caught off guard by the scale of infections? Or was this part of its COVID exit strategy? It's a busy day for Mr. Wang. Ever since China lifted all its zero COVID policies in December, business in his small eatery in Xi'an has been brisk. It is a welcome change for the 60-year-old who saw his business battered by the pandemic. For three years, China had imposed a strict zero COVID policy. This meant trying to eradicate the virus within its borders, which involved prolonged periods of lockdowns and quarantine. While the rest of the world reopened, China stuck to its guns, maintaining tight controls. But the restrictions would have repercussions. The World Bank estimates the Chinese economy grew just 2.7% in 2022, the lowest in 40 years. The CCP is looking at uh, their economic numbers and figure that they probably need to open up uh, to boost their economy in, uh, in the wake of uh, the demographic decline, uh, in the wake of uh, the effect um, of the maturing economy, and of course the effects of the, the closures. Zero COVID policies abruptly came to an end late last year. On December 7th, 2022, Beijing began to ease COVID measures. While well, Mr. Wang welcomed the move, just days after the relaxing of restrictions, he contracted the disease. During the three years of lockdown, Wang and his family had managed to avoid getting infected. And when he came down with COVID, he was not immediately alarmed. But 
咱还得要面对嘛。In softening the ground for the reopening, the government had changed its stance on COVID. It was no longer portrayed as the devil virus, but rather more akin to the flu, especially for the Omicron variant. But as Wang and others like him soon found out, COVID was a lot more severe. It is true that the virus is more dangerous than the flu. And I have some friends of mine who have not seen the virus before, who have some serious illness or have some serious illness. 抵抗力差一点的，都已经有的都走了，确实不是感冒。说明人们呢还是没有太够的这个足够的重视，或者说没有给大家这个一些正常的一些疏导啊啊，包括跟有些专家一开始一直强调说什么，呃，就像感冒一样啊，或者大家还是不够重视，就这样。Wang's experience was repeated throughout China. In the days and weeks following reopening, COVID infections surged. Official figures put the death toll at 60,000 in mid-January, a number which has been called into question. There was a lot of discussion about the definition of death in China, but I think that's, that's a smaller issue than the fact that there's very little testing being done. So 60,000, I, I mean, I think maybe there should be another zero on top of that, or at least in terms of the, the potential real number. Uh, the, the other studies in, in the literature have been talking about maybe a million deaths in China this winter from COVID. Affinity, a UK-based predictive health data analytics company, estimated the daily infection in China is 4.2 million, daily deaths, 34,000. So COVID-19, whichever the variant is, whether it's ancestral or current, can be equally deadly, all right? The only difference now in the context that we say it can be so-called mild is because most of us who are vulnerable are protected. Because it's going to be a problem if they are not vaccinated and they are not, you know, haven't had a natural infection. Because hybrid immunity, I mean, by which you have had previous vaccination and a natural infection, or a natural infection followed by vaccination, whichever way, is probably not very much prevalent in China. You didn't actually get the infection to spread, so people don't have that hybrid immunity. According to WHO, full vaccination using China-made vaccines will require three doses. And while almost 90% of the population received two doses of the vaccine, just 55% have had their third shot. Since last autumn, actually the Chinese government was already preparing for the gradual opening up and asking more and more elderly, especially in the big cities, to get vaccinated or even have the third or the fourth uh, uh, vaccines. Uh, but the process has been quite slow because many elderly people uh, do not really trust the quality of the vaccination. I think one of the reasons why older people didn't get vaccinated is because they didn't see an imminent risk. So they were maybe not against vaccination, but just putting off the decision because COVID wasn't in the community. They didn't think it was going to be imminent. Um, and then with that U-turn in December, all of a sudden, maybe there's a lot of old people who would have liked to get vaccinated, but it was too rushed. Um, and then they ended up getting COVID in December or January before having a chance to get vaccinated. And that, that's really a, a missed opportunity to save many lives. If you look at other cases of countries or societies that had something resembling zero COVID kind of policy or approach for a time, why did they do that? They did that to buy time, right? They did that to, uh, I mean, look at Singapore, for example, we had our circuit breaker. Um, but our leaders made it very clear that the main intention uh, was to ensure that we could get vaccinations up to a certain uh, uh, rate, right? Um, so it was a means to, to an end, right, in preparation for opening up. The spike in COVID cases could also be attributed to the quality of vaccines. 
The two most widely used vaccines in China are developed by Chinese pharmaceuticals Sinovac and Sinopharm. Both use inactivated virus to trigger an immune response and are considered less effective than Western mRNA vaccines. One study by Yale showed that the Sinovac vaccine did not produce enough antibodies to neutralize the Omicron variant. But when the EU offered to donate mRNA vaccines to China, it was rejected by Beijing. I do not think it's realistic for us to expect the Chinese government to accept uh, foreign-made uh, vaccines. I think the reason is simple, probably because, uh, due to the national security reasons, because they do not really trust uh, the quality of the uh, foreign-made uh, vaccines. Uh, that could be the main reason, especially when we see in uh, Xi Jinping's time, the Chinese government uh, has been talking more and more about self-reliance uh, strategy. If the decision is to sort of circle the wagon, so to speak, and dig in and just thanks but no thanks, we can sort it out ourselves, then um, in my own opinion, I think it's a wasted opportunity, uh, unfortunate one. But, you know, nationalism, right, you can't sort of discount the reality of uh, nationalism and the tendency of people to often want to fall back on that. Yeah? Um, but there are costs to doing that, I feel. With vaccination at inadequate levels, both in terms of quantity and quality, why then did China make such a rapid exit from COVID restrictions? The streets of Beijing are humming with life. Shopping, eating and festivities in time of the Lunar New Year. Beijing's notorious traffic snarl is back too. And,而且,有时候赶上周末呀,尤其年前的这段时间,大家走访亲友,串门,去买东西呀,被制备年货呀,或者一些商业圈啊,都是非常的多的。所以堵车的情况也非常的严重。Scenes like these were almost unthinkable just a few months before. As recently as October 2022, at the 20th Chinese Communist Party Congress, President Xi Jinping had reiterated China's commitment to the zero COVID policies. If we go back to October when President Xi Jinping said that zero COVID was the way forward for the country, I mean, I think that that was indicating there was no intention to change direction at that point, no, no need to make any kind of transition plans or preparations. So it came as a surprise that barely two months after Xi's speech, Beijing suddenly relaxed most of its COVID controls via a 10-point guideline. So what drove the decisions in, in the PRC is not entirely clear. They don't have a system that is uh, transparent enough for us to see. Uh, I think the protests that we saw last autumn put some pressure on the government to open up. The state's own claim is that they are seeing the current strains that are spreading to be more contagious, but um, less severe and less deadly. So they're saying that based on that judgment, uh, they are opening up. We know that actually China's economy was not in good shape since the beginning of the year, uh, largely because of the zero COVID uh, policy, especially the lockdown of the large cities like Shanghai and some other cities actually affected China's economy a lot. So that's why I think the economic management team uh, does not want to waste more time. So they decided to immediately change gears and change to this kind of uh, uh, opening up uh, overnight. 
instead of a gradual opening, Beijing had rolled back almost all restrictions in a matter of days. Overnight, a negative COVID test result was no longer required to enter most places, and those who are sick can quarantine at home instead of in field hospitals. Perhaps the speed in which it was done took the world by surprise. Now, the question is, uh, is, that, is that wrong? I don't think so, in the sense that um, at some point you have to open up. So I think if we really lay out all the different things that had to be done and could be done and all that, to me, perhaps the speed was, in, in, to, in my opinion, perhaps a little bit f f you know, too fast. The speed at which China exited COVID was matched by the rate of infections. In just two weeks after reopening, Chinese officials estimate that over 250 million people have contracted the virus. Yang Xiao, a media producer and cameraman, was one of them. Yeah,我在想有可能就是那天,然后在外边商场啊,或者在外边拍摄的过程当中,等会儿呼吸啊,还是一种接触的形式,然后就去,就有这个症状的,这什么了。除了发烧的这个情况是以前没有过的,就是
it, it was certainly a very dramatic new turn and, and very surprising. There's five year plans, 10 year plans and so on. Why wasn't there a plan for this transition that was made months in advance to say, okay, when we stop zero COVID, we're gonna have a period of two months or three months of proper mitigation with mask mandate, with hospitals ready for a surge in cases, with social distancing as much as possible to slow down the peak. There was that time where, where certain uh, measures uh, should have been taken in anticipation or in preparation for opening up. And looking at what is happening today, you cannot help but draw the conclusion that they probably didn't put in place all that was absolutely necessary before opening up. And we are in the situation we are in now as a result of that. Omicron has surged and attacked many countries. All other countries, when they hit US, Europe, all the countries went through the high spike of that. So I, I don't think that uh, uh, China is, is, uh, is EU prepared. Of course, I mean, because of the size of China and the population, you know, the largest, the most populous country in the world, it certainly had an impact there too. But overall, I think China has gradually managed to stabilize the situation. I, I think this situation will be stabilized. Nonetheless, there are worries that rather than stabilizing, there could be another infection spike on the horizon. The reason? The Lunar New Year. An estimated 2.1 billion trips will be made by the Chinese over this festive season, as many return to their hometowns for the first time in three years. This could be a vector for the virus to spread. So it's going to be a catalyst to bring the virus to the vast rural area where people are not immune enough. So whilst the peak of the epidemic can hit the cities faster because of the transmission being faster in cities, etc., it would take a while for the peak to hit the rural areas. And the rural areas may be where more the elderly people are and more, more distance they are away from healthcare. But for outside observers, it can be hard to grasp how the pandemic might play out in the coming months. The numbers that are being reported in terms of their mortality and in terms of statistics is completely dichotomous to reports from the ground in regards to how hospital facilities, crematoriums, everything is being overwhelmed. So who are we to believe? So I think that this is the kind of information that needs to be harmonized somewhere and that's kind of where the WHO is trying to get clarity. According to the WHO, official numbers are likely to be an underestimate. China records COVID infections at hospitals and fever clinics for those with recognized symptoms. Asymptomatic cases and positive results from home test kits are not included in the data. It has also been difficult to get data directly from healthcare professionals due to China's information controls and are working ever closer with our colleagues in China to try and understand better the transmission dynamics. We still do not have adequate information to make a, a full comprehensive risk assessment. Concerns over the lack of transparency are twofold. First, it hampers the WHO's ability to provide accurate pandemic risk assessments. And second, the world could be caught on the back foot should a new variant emerge in China. There's always a possibility that something new could come out of China. There could be a billion infections this winter. That's a lot of opportunities for the virus to evolve. And I think it's very important globally that we keep an eye on the virus. And that involves not only testing with PCR, but also doing the virus sequencing. And unfortunately in China, that's not being done very much. Beijing, however, insists that it is fully cooperating with the WHO and criticisms of its reporting are unwarranted. It takes time for them to get all numbers up. So I think it's still in this process. I don't think they deliberately want to hide anything or there is a switch of uh, 
used to counting on the on the PCR test. Now they are they are rely on the hospitals now to report the cases. Where at hospital now they have a standard, you have to be directly related to the COVID uh, death. Then you report. So so that's the system how it works. So whilst we on the outside like to know what's going on, and the only way we know is data, but for them, they are tackling a crisis at the same time, right? So I guess I'm not trying to make an excuse for China. I too would like to know <laughs> data, but I think that's a pra practical reality, that sometimes when you're fighting a crisis, you were operating, you have to operate in the fog of war. But what about the citizens within China? How are they reacting to China's COVID exit and subsequent surge in infections? For three years, you know, we've been told that we, we have to fight against it, we have to struggle against it. It's an enemy, you know, it's a war on COVID, you know, from, in, from a Chinese perspective. So COVID is the enemy, right? And then now I have to sort of live with the enemy. Policies can change overnight, but perspectives, mindsets and attitudes don't change uh, as quickly. How will the Chinese people view the leadership in the aftermath of the country's tangled transition out of the pandemic? When the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 first emerged in 2019, China's response to contain it was swift. It made the tough decision to implement nationwide quarantine, lockdowns and mandatory mass testing. For most of the first three years, China did a really good job in stopping COVID from spreading. We would have known if there were large epidemics of COVID in, in, in a city in China because we would have heard about hospitals being overwhelmed with patients. So we know that for most of the first three years, the low numbers of confirmed cases were, were reasonable numbers. Uh, there really wasn't much COVID in China. Following China's lead, a number of countries adopted similar zero COVID policies from Australia to Singapore to Vietnam. But as the virus continued to spread over the next two years, the strategy of containment was gradually abandoned it's really clear that there was no way we're going to get rid of this virus. It's gone too far. So zero COVID, therefore, uh, was a, an initial and early response. But once vaccines uh, became available and, and treatments became available, then zero COVID was not necessary. By the middle of 2022, China became the only major country to double down on zero COVID policies. As recently as October, millions in China were still under lockdown. Because Xi Jinping has tied the handling of COVID so much to his own personal legacy, so much that um, any sort of hint that you know, things are out of control could uh, create more questions about uh, Xi's leadership and his judgment. But there are things that even the CCP can't control, and the COVID-19 virus is one of them. By December 2022, China was finally prepared to ditch zero COVID restrictions. The official reason for the policy U-turn was the lethality of the Omicron variant being comparable to the flu. Hence, a COVID exit was now safe, a message that left many in China relieved. <laughs> <音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音
to some extent they are angry at the sudden change of the government policy and the rhetoric because yesterday they were told that the COVID was a very deadly virus. It can cause millions of lives if China fully opens up and choose to live, live with the COVID. But the next day, they were told by the experts that actually uh, the virus is no longer that uh, uh, dangerous and it has become a kind of a mild uh, uh, flu. So that's why I think many Chinese people are confused. So I think the protests and then sort of comments bubbling up online these days, we see that there is a sense among the uh, Chinese public that they are not as confident in the regime uh, and how they handle COVID. Uh, they are you know, questioning a lot of the leadership's choices and decisions. Perhaps acknowledging the unhappiness, President Xi struck a conciliatory tone during his New Year's Day address. In his speech, President Xi also signaled that China is turning the corner on the virus. And there are signs that the worst may be over. In late January, China's Center for Disease Control and Prevention reported that infections and deaths have fallen over 70%. And with estimates that over 80% of the population have contracted COVID, the Middle Kingdom could be on its way to herd immunity. Actually, the massive movement uh, around the Chinese New Year could help the country achieve the herd immunity uh, sooner. So that's, I think, probably the government's plan as well. Of course, they would not openly announce that, but I do think that once more and more people are traveling to their hometown or to, or to other places, actually uh, more places in China will reach the herd immunity. But achieving herd immunity can be complicated by variants. As the experience in other countries show, Newer variants raise the risk of reinfections. Xi Jinping's uh, newer message, uh, he did talk about bearing the short-term pain, but that's also a bet, right? It's a bet that um, they, they will get to herd immunity without having new strains and variants and mutations emerge that we don't even know about. I think uh, that's the big concern for many. So what we know now from um, you know, looking at living, having studied COVID for, you know, uh, over more, sorry, over two years now, is this that the infection um, does in some individuals do not give you as good an immunity as the vaccine. Then, in those who are vaccinated, many of us have also gone on to become infected, whether symptomatically or asymptomatically. Right? In th that scenario, where you have had an infection with vaccination and vaccination with infection. The, all the lab studies so far have shown that the immunity is better than anything that we could have uh, found in, at any other combinations. So now coming back to China's scenario, will, will letting the virus go through the population then create high levels of immunity? It depends on whether they have been vaccinated. As infection numbers dip, the Chinese stock market trended in the opposite direction. Since the start of 2023, the Shanghai Composite Index has seen a five-week rally. For some, 
These are encouraging signs of China's economic recovery after years of zero COVID restrictions. Things are back to normal. Even now, you know, restaurants, cinemas, stadiums are packed already. People are already less fearful and then everybody's embracing a new life. I'm sure this year, again, we'll have a double the you know, GDP of, of China for 2022, which is 3%. This year could be 6%. I suppose the hope is the economy will be going back to 100%, full steam ahead. Um, now, it may take time, of course, to, to get the momentum back, but I think that will be the, the idea. And there were commentators in China uh, in, in the past month talking about the idea of getting this wave over with more quickly in order to allow a, a, a more speedy reopening after the Lunar New Year. I don't think that that was good on public health grounds but I can understand the economic angle uh, for, for that argument. Look at the APEC, the G20 uh, last year, who was the most popular leader there? Who was the one leader that everyone was uh, queuing up to see? I'll give you a clue, it's not Joe Biden, right? Um, and there's a reason why everyone wanted to reconnect with uh, Xi Jinping, right? It's to position themselves and their economies for the eventual uh, reopening of China for business. And quite clearly, for the Chinese government, that is going to happen, you know, virus or not. With the gradual recovery, one sector in particular is expected to rebound quickly, travel. But are countries ready to welcome millions of Chinese tourists while COVID numbers remain high? Prior to the pandemic, the Chinese were the largest group of international travellers, logging over 150 million trips in 2019. With China's travel restrictions lifted on January 8th, after three years of tight controls, Chinese tourists are able to venture out into the world again. It is estimated that outbound travellers from China will reach pre-pandemic levels by the second half of this year but some countries appear hesitant to welcome them over fears of renewed outbreaks. Many countries have sort of learned to live with COVID. They've moved on. They've got certain procedures in place. So, you know, in a sense, there is some degree of uh, stability in societies already, um, which includes having COVID circulating. And now that China is opening up, people are going to start travelling. Whether that is going to unsettle this sort of stability, this equilibrium, and uh, to what extent, uh, and what are the consequences of that, these are all uh, unknown uh, at this point in time. If the vulnerable people in any given population are still not adequately protected, and you're going to let in a surge of people who have got as yet unclear vaccination or infection status, then that's going to expose these groups of people. There are also concerns that a new variant of the SARS-CoV-2 virus could emerge in China and proliferate through Chinese travelers. There are currently numerous sub-variants, some very adept at escaping existing vaccines. For example, it is estimated that mRNA vaccines only have a 30% efficacy against the new Kraken subvariant. These viruses mutate, and so new mutations will always keep springing out. Now, some of them will then um, cause uh, our antibodies to be less potent in, in binding to them and killing them, preventing infection. So far, no new variant has emerged from China. But even if one were to appear, many experts believe the threat is low. I think that in most parts of the world where vaccination rates have been high and that we've also gone through the Omicron waves or the Delta waves, our immunity in the population is actually very, very high. 
that no matter what China throws at us, at least for now, you know, we know that we have the immunity levels to protect against it. Nonetheless, some countries have taken precaution against Chinese travelers. As of January, the United States, Britain, Australia, Japan and South Korea have enforced rules such as pre-departure COVID-19 tests, testing upon arrival and quarantine for those that test positive. Morocco went so far as to ban all arrivals from China. I think it's a kind of natural response from China's sudden opening up of COVID policy because I think many reports uh, showed that there are increasing number of deaths and infections. So I think it would be natural for some foreign governments to change their travel policies upon Chinese visitors, especially when they consider the previous uh, uh, experience at the very beginning of the COVID outbreak. But these restrictions have aroused anger among many in China. Chinese state media decried them as discriminatory, while social media users called South Korea's measures insulting. In a tit-for-tat move, China halted short-term visas for South Koreans and Japanese travelers, and all visitors to China are required to produce a negative COVID-19 test result. They are trying to put the point across to other countries. It is uh, not in their interest for uh, them to be keeping uh, China out. The point is obvious, the point is clear, that China is a major player. To be at the receiving end of this kind of response from other countries in the international community for uh, a major power, I mean, uh, whether it's China or the United States or whoever. I mean, they're not used to these kinds of things. Now, I suspect what is really going on is uh, this, you know, speaking to a domestic audience, trying to move uh, on China's uh, sense of, or cultivate a sense of nationalism, where they don't want to show weakness, where they want to show that they are standing up to the world, they're not going to get bullied. Part of the rationale for the opening up is to make sure that trade and economic flows and business exchanges can happen again. So if China is going to impose reprisals, then that's counterproductive to part of the rationale for wh what they want to do in the first place. Ultimately, with the resumption of global travel, Placing restrictions only on Chinese tourists will be futile. If there was a new strain emerging in one part of the world, travel measures will not stop that strain from, from getting to other parts of the world. Whether it's a new strain emerging in China, a new strain emerging in the United States or, or elsewhere, anywhere in the world, the, the virus can get around those travel measures. Unless you do what China had been doing a year ago, what Singapore had been doing, two years ago, which is every traveller goes into a quarantine facility. Without going to that extreme, then I don't think travel measures really have many rationale. On January 15, the WHO received new data from China. The agency said that the reported data indicate a decline in case numbers, hospitalizations, and those requiring critical care since the spread of infection started in December last year. This suggests that China has crested the COVID wave. Consequently, the risks associated with Chinese travelers and the need for restrictions will diminish. Actually, when we look at traveler testing data in Taiwan, in people who've come from the mainland, that was 20, 30% maybe a couple of weeks ago. It's now down to below 10% positive on arrival by PCR. So it looks like the peak was early January, late December nationwide. I think chances are very good that things will have to get worse before they get better. Now, in terms of the most optimistic scenario, I think it's if the CCP and Xi Jinping's bet works and uh, infections, uh, hospitalizations, deaths are sort of under control. There is herd immunity and you know, there might be a, a slight disruption in the beginning, but then things smooth out for the rest of the year. China is very committed to getting the economy back on track. And the virus aside, that is actually a matter of some relief for the rest of the world. So for the rest of the world, it really is a matter of 
sort of striking their own balance about how to um, how to sort of gradually open the door to um, uh, Chinese uh, tourists, Chinese visit business visitors, uh, Chinese business. Yeah. Um, uh, I think this is going to be the one of the definitive issues of this year uh, going forward the next few months. With expectations that travel restrictions will ease in the coming months, around 60% of Chinese surveyed say they plan to travel overseas. A freelancer in the media industry, Yang Xiao for one, is looking forward to this return to normalcy. China's reopening had come with a mounting death toll. But if the worst is truly over, there is some cause for optimism, not just for China, but the world. The pandemic risk has passed because the virus is now circulating globally. I think China was the last holdout. So now that, that China have, have moved to living with the virus, I think that will be the trigger that we actually declare the pandemic is finally over. And that will be a, a relief, I think. The virus hasn't gone, but there's no longer such a strong rationale for public health measures in the long term. Yangxiao 